and reading your bio, it really knocks my socks off. And it's really good to welcome to the program and in the audience. Welcome very, very much to Conversations. Great per pleasure to welcome to the program our guest, uh, Howard Weinberg. And Howard Weinberg is a veteran television uh, producer and filmmaker. He's a documentary filmmaker and a television journalist in a very deep sense. I, we're going to hear the story from him, but he was involved with the Dick Cavett Show and getting Robert McNeil going and a whole lot of other names that are legend in the, in the industry. And uh, Howard, welcome so very much to Conversation. Thank you, Harold. My great good pleasure, young man. Could you share with me your background? Born and raised... Well, I, I, I've got to tell you, when I started mm. in television, mm -hmm. uh, I tried to do stand-ups and to, to be on. To you do know. some shtick? Uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, I tried to... Uh, to do what you do, be on air. Oh, and yeah. and when I left my first job in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. uh, the graphic artist painted my, my face on my hand, uh -huh. and he said, "How to get on television?" <laughs> and why? Because they would cut my stand-ups out all the time. <laughs> but then the last program that I did yeah. for CBS, yeah. the Religion Unit, uh -huh. I was on air. I hosted it, yeah. and I wrote it, and I narrated it, yeah. and. So I guess I've come about, a long way. <laughs> yeah, you've come a long way from there. Yeah, but when you do stand, when I think stand up, I just automatically think comic. You know. Oh sure. sure. Well, I've them, always you know. liked uh, yeah. comedy. Yeah. You know, Me too. I, I always have, and I, in fact, um, a, a good friend of mine's son is uh, very high up on the Daily Show. Oh really? And uh, I said that I think they're doing some of the most important journalism now, Couldn't agree because. More. They have this ability to search and say, look what you said last year. Look yeah. what you said five years ago. Right. Look what you're saying now. It's right. a little different. Right. So yeah. that kind of ability is fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I, I admire them. Also, I'll yeah. tell you a funny story. Okay. In terms of where we get our news, mm -hmm. I, I used to produce these DuPont uh, forums for the yeah. DuPont Columbia Awards. Right. And we would have, I did four of them. Uh -huh. And one of my theories was that we were getting our news from television. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, from talk shows, from right. comedy. Yeah. And uh, so we had a panel that Dick Cavett was on and mm -hmm. some others, and Ted Koppel moderated it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we had a prior panel mm. that was on uh, campaign finance. Okay. So the fellow right. from the Pew Charitable Trust right. who was on that panel, right. uh, Andrew Kohut, mm -hmm. he yeah. stayed and listened to the panel that we did uh, on comedy. Mm. And he said he took a poll afterwards mm -hmm. and he proved our thesis. Oh, and really? A few months later in the cover, front page of the New York Times was most Americans are getting their news from stand-up comedy That's on late night it. television. <laughs> so I thought, this is fantastic. Yeah, right, right. It was just an instinct. That, you had you had an input to the yeah. human consciousness. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, that was it. really good. That's but it. where were you? You were here well, say Milka Walker. I, I, my, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, Nebraska. That's, uh, that's what's his name's territory, isn't it? Johnny Carson. Not Johnny Dick Carson. Carson. No, but they Marlon Buffett. Brando. Uh, isn't Henry Buffett? Fonda. Warren Buffett. Uh, and all Warren, those people. All those people. All those from, people. Uh, from Iowa. From Omaha. From Omaha itself. Yeah. All those people. Yeah, and they were nearby. Or nearby, or the suburbs yeah. there. Okay. What Tom Brokaw there? worked in Omaha at one point. He did. He worked. So there. many people worked in. But Omaha. you were drug up there, raised I, there. Drug up. <laughs> no, I was. I, I was raised. Yeah, from yeah. the age of one. Was it? Was it suburban? A rural? No. It, well, it was a small city. Yeah. I mean, when I went to school, there was actually a wilderness behind the school. There was no ca kidding. a cave, and but we were. It was the edge of a city. Yeah. Right. I learned from my uncle that he could walk downtown, and and did. On an occasion, walk downtown. What does that mean? Well, we lived at Fifty Third Street. Yeah. About, I don't know, twelve blocks north or something like that. Twenty blocks. Or here north. in New York. No, no. This was in. Oh, in, they had a Fifty Third yeah, Street in, in Omaha, okay. and he told me he walked downtown, and I said, "My God, that's pr that's great." Yeah. I mean, New York's a walking city. Yeah. I, I, my this friend I grew up with came to New York once, and he played tennis all the time, and he was huffing and puffing. And I, I said, what's the problem? Yeah. He, he said, well, I don't walk this much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah, I know. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, yeah. I, I went to Dartmouth. Okay. And when I was in college, uh. documentary was on television everywhere. Oh, okay. And why was documentary on? Because of the quiz show scandals. So oh, everybody right, was trying to right. look good. Van, and they what's started, his name? Yeah. Oh. Or the guy that had the... I who was thinking of? Van Boren? Was it? Oh, Charles Van Doren. Yeah, Van Doren. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. But because yeah. of all that, uh, there was a lot of network documentaries. Okay. So obviously, I uh, I came to New York and thought I would 
do that. I tried to get a job, and then I decided, well, well, I... I did I, you study television in Dartmouth? No, I mean, or I, I went... What did you take your degree in? I went to Dartmouth, and yeah. my degree was in government. In government. Right. Okay. But I, I was editor of the newspaper, okay, so there's the journalism. You. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, while I was there, I made a film. Okay. And my professor took the film, no instructions, he gave me a 30, uh, or a short film about making films. Okay. And he gave me 1,300 feet of film. Okay, was that 8 millimeters? 16? No, 16. 16. 16. Did you steam back to do no, it? No, that was before steam back. Rewinds. Rewinds. Did you and have to put a little piece of, t of paper in where you were going to? You know, I can't, rem I can't remember mm. whether we hot spliced mm. or taped. Yeah. And I, and it, because we, I hope we didn't hot splice, although mm. at one point we did, because mm. you'd lose a little bit of the frame yeah, if you did okay, that. Yeah, okay, yeah. But uh, anyway, I went to the, yeah. uh, Russia was opening up, the Soviet Union, right. and made a film called The Russians, and it was one of the outstanding films of 1961, 62. How did you get from politics to filmmaking? I mean, what was well, the transition I, that got you in terms of no, well, I interest took, in that? I'll tell you, I took Communication? A, I always was interested yeah. in photography. Oh, okay. And okay. it's still photography. Yeah. And I put together a slideshow mm -hmm. of a, a previous trip to, to Europe and Russia uh -huh. and uh, learned that I could tell a story and uh -huh. I want, and because, I don't know, there was just parallels. I was well, interested in words and pictures. Did oh, you, I, yeah, well, no, I, there, actually I hired a, a fellow who um, later worked as NPR's lawyer. Oh, wow. And he went to school with me and he did the voice at that point. Okay, And right. um, And it turned but out. you wrote the script? I wrote, wrote the, I wrote the script. Okay, I yeah, okay, yeah. Did all that. And I edited it myself. Well, that's a pretty big thing to take on. It was. And had mm -hmm. you thought about going into politics, or were you just interested in No, I was in interested in journalism. In, I mean, in journalism. In journalism. Political journalism, or I no, guess No, I think just a, a journalist. Okay, I was interested good. in documentary film. Okay. But my father wanted me to go to law school. Yeah, all right. So I got into Harvard uh -huh. and decided not to go there. You and I went to Stanford, <laughs> and why did I go to Stanford? Because I knew they had a broadcasting and film school. Okay, you went to Harvard Law. I mean, Stanford no, I didn't. Law? Stanford Law. Stanford for Law. three months, and I started a film society. I wrote a column for the Stanford Daily, and I said, mm -hmm. "What am I doing here? I don't really want to be in law school." So mm -hmm. I transferred to broadcasting and film. Was and your dad a lawyer? No, did no, your no, dad he was want a businessman. You to do law? I think he did. Yeah, you know, and but so, I want to make films. No, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was so intrigued by documentary. I had yeah. been an intern after college at the Washington Post. Okay. And when this won the award, I thought, my God, that may be something I'm yeah, good at. You know? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it really was the synthesis of words and pictures for Yeah, me. right. Uh -huh. And um, so it took a while. I mean, I, I transferred to broadcasting and film school, and then it, uh, the Vietnam. At Stanford? At Stanford. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. And then I realized that was oriented... Uh, Got to meet Pauline Kael. Wow, for example, over great. There. she was great. It, yeah. it was a fascinating Pretty program, cool. but it wasn't oriented toward uh, television documentary or journalism. Towards feature So I films. decided, well, I've got to go to. Well, no, it was it was edit, uh, it was oriented toward the sponsored film. Okay. And okay. I and uh, industrials. Yeah, yeah. yeah right, and I right. decided That's well, where the money was. I guess. Well, maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Uh, but I decided that uh, I would eventually go to. Columbia, but I, Columbia uh, more than NYU. Right? Well, the journalism school was okay. a reputation. Okay, yeah, it has a good. But at that yeah. time, uh, so you're still I, thinking television journalism. Yeah, yeah, okay, journalism. Yeah, and but and journalism bespeaks interest. At least if you look at what's called the news and so uh, a journalist, it, it's practically all politics. No, it, it, it's, they don't have very much with science and things like well, that, it, uh, or at least in what they call the news. It's yeah. too dominated by it, politics, that's for sure. It, the journalism in I mean, general. It seems to be, yeah. if you look on television, that's all there is. Yeah. A very careful ne negotiations between one part of a subclause or something. Well, so, somebody, else would say, somebody else would say it was crime news. Hmm. I mean, that's... that's well, at the or, local, particularly, yeah, and, rapes and things. And news you can use. Yeah. I mean, but, listen, there's a whole world. There's science journalism, there's arts and culture journalism, there's sports journalism. Nova, we have a few well, things in public television, yeah. but on the ball, it's news. There, I, there could be more. And there, that's the linking between journalism is yeah. thought of as by the news and politics. Yeah, yeah. But um, I think that... Um, international politics were you interested in? You were well, in Russia. What took I was you in Russia. Russia? Were you uh, well, that was in the geopolitics? Or in what year? The, oh, that was... I'll tell you, when I first went to Russia, yeah. it was on a, by chance, yeah. a Scandinavian student travel tour. Right. And uh, because I ran into somebody who was going, and mm -hmm. I was in Copenhagen, and they said, 
if you stay here for 10 days, you get a visa, you can go. And yeah. that, that was the summer of my junior years. And then I went so back. What year would that have been, though? That was uh, 61. 61, okay. But, but, but in early, nine yeah. months, between yeah. the time I was there first uh -huh. and when I went back in the spring of 62, uh -huh. it went from, Le uh, from the Lenin-Stalin tomb uh -huh. to the Lenin tomb. So there was just... Oh, you were they going were, they through were that transformation. Dramatic, yeah. and also, a month after we were there the first time, uh, the Berlin Wall went up. We were there in August of uh, 61. Right. The that first was time. culminate in 89. Yeah, yeah. With but it coming down. Yes, absolutely. The walls go up, the walls come down, and everything. So but that you was. Had, you had an interest in Russia in politically or no, culturally? I don't, or? No, I think it was just uh, curiosity. Yeah, and you're young, and there's a chance to. Curiosity. Do it. I mean, you, you just, didn't know Russian. You don't speak no, Russian or do anything no, like no. that. You didn't have Russian background or no, anything? No grandparents no. or family? Well, I think, I think my mother's family. Uh, may have come, but she was born in Omaha, uh -huh. but I think they may have come from uh, <coughs> the greater Minsk area. Right, right, right. But, but that wasn't it. I mean, yeah. it was just... Uh, okay. But you got into television, then, and you were, yeah. that was your thing? You, you gave up the law? Clarence yeah. Darrow, goodbye. But, uh, uh, Cecil B. DeMille, <laughs> hello. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, it wasn't so much that. I'll, I'll tell you what else was happening. Yeah. Uh, not only was documentary very prominent okay. on, public tele on, on television, mm -hmm. when I, uh, commercial television, uh, when I was in college, mm -hmm. but Cinema Verite was okay, yeah. coming right. into being. With Primary in 1960. Uh -huh. In 63, there was a uh, crisis behind a presidential commitment. Bob Drew. Uh -huh. I later learned uh -huh. when Bob Drew made just a few years ago, that my professor, my teacher yeah. at Dartmouth was a man named Blair Watson. Uh -huh. He was in the same fighter squadron or pi uh, that uh, Bob Drew was in. Oh, I'll be damned. In World War II, and, uh -huh. they, and he made a, a film about it. Had and they, I, and there they, I saw him. I couldn't believe it. Had they done uh, journalism in the war, war journalism? No, I don't. Ernie well, Pyle but Bob was a... Uh, I, uh, he or even, he uh, was uh, a Time Magazine correspondent okay. who uh -huh. then went to uh, Harvard on an Eman Fellowship uh -huh. and decided that television could be more exciting. Right. I mean, if you remember at that time, uh, television was rather static. I yeah. mean, Fred Friendly, who I Gosh, later worked Fred with Friendly, at yeah. CBS, he said, television is like writing with a one-ton pencil. <laughs> and, you know, oh, that's a great line. Is, and, that, is that line tried my Oh, yeah. We use it. He, we can use absolutely. it in the public domain. He, he, he wrote yeah. that. I mean, he uh -huh. said it. And I would always quote that. Mm -hmm. um, I later taught with him. Uh, he, we started a program called the Jump Into Journalism for Black Youth at uh -huh. Columbia Journalism School Okay. in 68 in response to the Kerner Commission report. Was there somebody, Sutcherman or something? Stuart Sutcherman, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 He, yeah he, worked, working, he worked with Fred. And they did that, the Constitution, the Delicate Balance? That was later. That, that was, was later. later. That was yeah, later. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. But mm -hmm. this was this was a program called uh, for minority journalists, right. and then he had me come into the full program, uh -huh. and that was my early experience in teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think the excitement over I, I when I was at Columbia, I wrote my thesis on cinema verite. I met mm -hmm. Bob Drew and Ricky Leacock mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Al Mazels mm -hmm. and uh, Don Pennybaker and all these people Verite, who are doing... Uh, I like that. I like that. Because well, I, I walk around life thinking I'm living in a movie and I see <laughs> Academy Award performances every day on the streets of New York if you, yeah. know, if you have the right angle and the right... right you know. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? I think they were paying attention to, and they... Yeah. Uh, they they didn't want to interfere with reality. They yeah. wanted to capture reality. Well, I I sense that. I I don't want to go off on an obiter dictum or some mm -hmm. sort of off to thing, but I really think that uh, I can understand where people get angst ridden or upset or something, but I can't understand how anybody would get bored because there's so much going on at right. all levels right, and right. everything, and it's like walking around in a movie, and it's so exciting and everything. Just life and and rea it, that's very dull because i know you have i know it and i got a daughter in theater right and oh, she yeah. thinks that she sometimes thinks i'm a, i'm a, a what do you call it well, uh, you know what john lennon said what john lennon said, said he said a lot of good he things. said life is what happens while you're making other plans oh okay that's another <laughs> good know, that's, another good that's in the public domain i think so i, I think you know what it can do you know but anyway she thinks i may be a bit of a philistine because i don't know if you're acting you're you're not i mean if people if people are learning how to act, you got an acting. It's a great career. It's an art form. We understand, just right. like playing a piano or something. But but they're they're coming and they're pretending that their dog or cat was just run over by a steamroller, mm -hmm. and their cat and dog was not run over mm -hmm. by a steamroller. And so they're like, in a certain sense, learning how to conjure, or one mm -hmm. could use a loaded word, lie, right. in terms of what they're going to draw upon. It's like getting over. 
It's well, not, but if the person's cat and dog, Verite, actually was run over by the steamroller, then the emotions are very real and right. immediate. Do you understand? You know, so I, the Verite, I think reality is more interesting than anything you can put on the stage or screen. For well, I, you know, I, I, I think uh, I a, gra a great artist is, is wonderful as I an know. actor yeah. and all that, and I don't disparage it at all, mm. uh, but the assumption that everybody interested in documentary wants to eventually make a feature, some do, and that's fine, they don't. I mean, because they believe, as you do, that reality is more interesting. Also, you know, there's sometimes you miss things inevitably when, when you're filming there's something. There's an awful lot. You miss a it lot. It leaves a lot to be missed. <laughs> but but you know what? Yeah. I said I don't want to ask anybody to do it again. Uh -huh. And oh, why don't I want to ask him to no do it again? No second take production. Huh? Because I'm turning somebody who's not a trained actor into a bad actor. Right. So I don't want to ask him to. Wow. I want to say, what was the emotion that I missed? What was the what, and then let's be on the lookout for something equivalent, uh -huh. so I can capture that. Right. And that's that's what you want to do, as uh -huh. a, I think, as a documentary filmmaker. Okay, that's but good. But there's so you... many people worried about. Well, did he walk into the door? Right, <laughs> right. One of my students recently shot something in, in Queens, and I I looked. I said, "You asked him to walk into that door again, didn't you?" <laughs> yeah. I said, "Yeah. How'd you know?" You could tell. And by I said, "You could length. tell by his body language. Yeah, yeah, he was right. stiff. He was uncomfortable." Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He, he, he was go, acting. Yeah, right. he, he's not a trained actor. <laughs> Don't ask exactly, him to do that. That's exactly the point. Yeah. Just captured it's going. But anyway, you got involved in with a lot of the the whole the whole television world. And let's share a couple because I see on your bio it's just eye poppingly interesting. You were, for instance, among other things, the producer or executive producer of the Dick Cavett effort. The, the, well, that happened. I, I had, that's incredible. Dick Cavett was a genius. <laughs> well. Well, he maybe was great. you saw another side I, of him. I, I thought no, he was I, great. I, yeah. That was a great experience because mm. I got to meet a couple of my heroes. Yeah. I mean, I got to meet they Mickey see. Mantle, for example. Oh, wow. And, you know, when I was a kid, my we came to New York, and I yeah. got to go to the Bronx and see him play at Yankee Stadium. And, you and I got to him? talk to him and meet him, yeah. For a, did you have a beer And I said, no, no, just but in the green room. You oh. know, and I remember saying to him, well, you know, um, Mickey? What I loved... Did you call him Mickey? I, I must have. I, yeah. I said, you know what I loved was when you threw somebody out at first base from center field. He yeah. Said, and he said, yeah, I did that more than once. I love doing that. Yeah. <laughs> he, hey. said, he said, I would kind of like pretend I, I didn't quite catch it or, or I, I was muffling the ball. And just when I got him and they were on their way to second, oh. I had the ball. Then I threw oh, him out throw at him first. Oh, out on getting back to first base. Yeah. 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 I yeah. see. Yeah. That was so, I mean, the pleasure that he evinced in doing that. Yeah, now, yeah, I had yeah. a certain pleasure. That's how getting over, isn't it? Yeah. I guess there's some of that in the human condition. Yeah. It's not to be scared. Also, but Dick Cavett was so clever and he had such good people on. It was such a a major show, and you helped put that one together? Or well, I, I don't want to get ahead no, of the, I wouldn't the curve. No, I wouldn't say, say that I did it, because uh, in all honesty, Cabot had his own production company. Okay. And my job uh -huh. was to be the executive producer for Channel 13. Okay. And to, at that time, we had something in public television called the Station Program Cooperative. Okay. And you had uh -huh. to pitch programs to them and you had to sell it to them. Mm -hmm. Basically the group of stations had right. to say we want this next year. Okay. So the that's idea the way that works I'd be curious. Yeah, that's yeah. changed yeah. now, but okay. but the way that was mm -hmm. my job was Let's try to sell it. So what did we do? We enlarged the, the program. I mean, it wasn't just Enlarged two, in time, you mean? No, in, in its in appearance. production value? In, in production value. Yeah. For example, it would be like two chairs like this. Yeah, right. And I said, we need a beginning. And I wanted him to come out and tell a joke. Well, he didn't want to tell a joke, but he agreed to come out from the wings and, and open, the, and we enlarged the set, and we figured out a way to, uh, to change the studio so we could uh, store the... Uh, the set pieces in the balcony, and then we uh, economically so there yeah, and, be and no, we yeah. we swallowed a, a room. You we swallowed to, the McNeil Lair set with a uh -huh. platform. We did a lot of things, and so my job was to try to make it work, make it efficient. We also got to meet uh, Muhammad Ali. We uh -huh. did a program on a, a riverboat in New Orleans. You did a boat on a riverboat. Yeah, you that, did actual footage. Yeah, we shot with Muhammad Ali. Without, mm -hmm. That's great. So we got to do That's these special stuff. things. Yeah. And, and we did sell the show. But I will say, the next year... That was a segment with Cavett? Yeah. With Muhammad Ali yeah. on a riverboat? Yeah. Good. That was yeah. good. Did you yeah, we did. We did uh, How did it happen to be on that? Did, was it set well, up because ahead of P time? The, the PBS, yes, sure. The yeah. PBS program was, uh, I think the convention was in 
uh, New Orleans. Okay, that good. So yeah. that was the uh, the reason for yeah, doing. Yeah, you got to move with the flow. Yeah, yeah. The world. You do some yeah, the special work. You got to do exactly. that as executive exactly. producer. Yeah. yeah. But that was good. You worked with him, and then you've uh, and you've been involved in that for so long. It must have been really satisfying to be in touch with them. Cavett was very clever. He was also, was that scripted, or how much was it scripted, or how did they put it together in terms of the on-camera people? Did they try to have a, a formula, like uh, Leno will open with a monologue? No, 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 I don't think, I don't think so. I, th I think that basically he had a team of people that uh, researched the, the people, did pre-interviews, mm. so he knew the, uh, the material. And then also he was spontaneous. He would, as you would, he would bring up what he was interested in. Yeah, I never know what I'm going to say when I open yeah, yeah. my mouth. Well, until because it just grows like top right, right, to right. me in, in real life. You and know? I think that's what he did. I mean, I now I will tell you this: that when I started the Robert McNeil Report, and now was the wait first a minute, that's another that. that's another huge yeah, but that piggy. was that was before started Dick Cavett, and then well, I didn't was, start Dick Cavett. No, I took Dick Cavett over and helped sell it. Yeah. You enlarged it. I did. Area. All right, for right. PBS, that's right. a big thing. And I heard you just mentioned it on the sidebar. Uh, McNeil Lair. Well, what yeah. I want to tell you about, about another huge because event. that was a program that really was scripted in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinary to work with Robin and Jim because they devoted all their time to it. They, uh, and we tried to think, well, if we ask this question, mm -hmm. where will the person go? Will mm -hmm. he slip out? <laughs> yeah. And we and I developed the idea of having a live television show unfold as a documentary would. So you would have an anecdotal lead, for example, okay. or a magazine article would. So, oh, so it, it would okay. develop. Right. And now this was revolutionary for television. We right. wouldn't introduce every guest in the beginning. Uh -huh. Because I figured if it would be like at a party. All if right. you meet five people at yeah, once, right. you can't remember who, who was who. You maybe yeah. remember one or two. Right, right. So I said, let's introduce people as they have a function in the story. Mm -hmm. So sometimes somebody would come on, they were the metaphor, they mm -hmm. would trigger the event. Right. And then you'd say, okay, now th this businessman has a problem. W what does the senator have to say? Uh -huh. what, well, what does the bureaucrat have to say? And, and this, you and had a build. panel of people there? No, it, no was, it, it, was a, it was a, a round group, table. a round table. Yeah, okay, right, okay. But, but they weren't all introduced at once. Uh -huh. And it would develop, and that was the whole Key uh, idea see. for but, the for the report, yeah. yeah, and and we blocked it out, uh -huh. and we had we had it in segments. Uh -huh. So my job would be to be in Robin's ear and uh -huh. say, okay, move on to the next segment, right, 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 you know, right. because he was a real gentleman, or well, he is a real, well, he gentleman. is, yeah, right, right, and he was the consummate television journalist. Uh huh. You know, well, he, it was Merle. Well, I know, but yeah. I mean, in the, uh, in that I've known. In our time, yeah. Because okay, right. he really could do the full range. Right. Of, yeah. He could anchor, he could do documentaries. He worked with the BBC and did documentaries in a couple of weeks. He was a wonderful. You think the people that are in front of the camera, whether news, like Dan Rather or whoever, and we've had a whole go Cronkite mm -hmm. is, a, is a, yeah. a towering figure in that, yeah. that they are all very, very gifted people who have a wide uh, understanding of the human condition, are what would we call called intellectuals or do they are they people who can just keep to the script or what is your idea about well, the people I, that are on camera representing the news and or the expansion on the news such as some piece of revealed reality well I look hmm. Having dealt with they're them not, all. They're not, they're not mm. all Ted Baxter's, I will assure you. That. Okay? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what's, what was very... That's encouraging. What's yeah. very impressive to me, when I worked with Harry Reasoner mm -hmm. at 60 Minutes... Another he, giant, well, yeah. It, I, we had a very interesting experience. We were doing a program on campaign finance. Okay. And now I came out of public television. Still a television. big issue. Still a big issue. Still there. That it, issue absolutely. is like, is like uh, Everest. And we had footage... Away. For example, if it yeah. was public television, I would have done a half-hour film on it. Right. 60 minutes, I could do 12 minutes. Okay. So we took the core, the strongest piece out of what we had. Oh. But through a fluke, yeah. I had Harry Reasoner for about a week. Uh. And I saw him get into the story, get smarter and smarter in, in how he asked questions and how he understood what was happening. Right. And he hadn't done the pre preparation work. Right. He'd read some... You know, yeah. memos that yeah. I'd written, but uh, I'd done it. Mm -hmm. And I and it was fantastic. I yeah. said, my God, there's a reason why he, he is where he is. Yeah. And, but mm -hmm. he said to me, Howard, I can't give you this much time uh -huh. on a regular basis. I usually can give you two days. Mm -hmm. So too often. You said you had six? We had six days, yeah. yeah that's a lot of time. It, it was just, have, it was. Did you develop a story for 60 minutes? Is that what you Yeah, yeah, we did. Okay, we did with, I don't understand how uh, that all works. Uh, uh, you were the producer, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I mean. Oh. What had to remain on the cutting room floor right. was um, 
God, uh, Stuart Mott, who, who Stuart Mott, remember I, that? Who, who, I knew him. Who funded uh, the McCarthy campaign. And I went to and go those... to Stuart Mott with a, com a camera one yeah. day in August in his penthouse, cause I, and I was looking for, it was about 112 degrees or something in New York, Yeah. and I went up hoping, that because we're, we're going to do it in his place, and I said, thank God, I'm looking for the air, and he had no air conditioning because <laughs> he had his place full of plants. You oh, know? my God. Yeah. But you know what was so great about him? He said to me, and, we, and this never made air, and I thought it was... I still think about it. He said, in order, he, he said, I'm still a fat cat. Yeah, they just yeah. changed the law, the campaign finance. You're talking Stuart Mott. Stuart Mott. Yeah, yeah. He said, I'm still a fat cat, yeah, yeah. but I have to work in a different way. Mm -hmm. He said, the only solution to overcoming money in politics mm -hmm. is to change the law every three years and before the lawyers can catch up with it <laughs> and figure out ways around it. Uh -huh, and I thought that was A big brilliant. issue then, a big issue yeah. now. What we did show mm -hmm. was Philip Stern uh, who would go around and embarrass congressmen uh, in their local districts right. for taking money uh, from industries on whose committees they were supposed to be. Trying to make that point. Yeah. It's like, just, it, it shouldn't have to be made. I think it's being made increasingly, and it's only growing, I think, yeah, the influence yeah. of money, isn't it, though? So there's a couple of problems you were addressing that you have not yet been addressed. Is that your sense of the human condition? Oh, anything. A couple, you know, maybe one or two. You know, I, I did it. Uh, I did an <laughs> Making a joke, son. Yeah. I did an environmental yeah. documentary in 1973 yeah. called yeah. The Oregon Attitude, okay? Yeah. I did another one uh, called Within Our Power for yeah. Bill Moyers. That was from, well, both of them for Moyers. Again, another iconic figure. That's Bill right. Moyers. In you've, 19, been. I mean, you've been with them all. Yeah, 1978, 79. And. You know, and then I did a 60 Minutes piece uh, on Avery Levins, the genius uh, yeah, who yeah, runs the Rocky uh, yeah, Mountain environmentalist, yeah, right. yeah. And you know, you would have thought that we would have learned. You know, yeah, all yeah. the evidence was there. We did learn in small ways. Uh -huh. I mean, yes, there's more energy efficiency, but not in a big way. Yeah. Not in 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 really making a difference in society. No, we still have mm -hmm. that big difference. To be. It's like as though when they only let Galileo off the hook about the tw Catholic Church about <laughs> 12 years ago <laughs> for in saying uh, that we were not the center of the universe. Right. And Hieronymus Bosch made all those paintings because it was such a traumatic blow to the human identity, that proposition that it held for so long. And we're in a pe period now of transform, uh, my own personal. Yeah, opinion. yeah. We're in a period of, of of transformation that, at a large existential level, that is so is so comprehensively significant that it's not a mere par paradigm's far too small. A paradigm, a paradigm, a paradigm, a paradigm, a paradigm shifts right. that we're going through now. So we still have a lot of the problems we've been addressing singularly, but it's an overall comprehensive change that might be uh, in the offing now. I did a program, if I may, share mm -hmm. with you with, uh, who's the fellow, the famous guy, uh, the um, polymath? Um, oh, Dord, it'll come to me in a minute. It'll come to uh, Isaac Asimov. Mm -hmm. Isaac Asimov was a giant. And he said, this is 200,000 years we've been here, 10,000 generations. This is the single most Im impressive and important generation. I think he was thinking 75 years <coughs> or something, 75 to 2050. Uh, ever in the evolution of humanity hmm. because we're at such a transition point in terms of coming to, in a certain sense, the end of one era and the beginning of another. And I think that's true, it, that it, we live at a time of, it's not a little change, it's not a quantitative change. Uh, history it's probably be, as big as his, the Industrial Revolution. No, 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 no the no. Industrial Revolution is far too tiny. It's just <laughs> a tiny little part yeah, yeah. of what it is that we're going through a thing that affects every institution, every notion of human nature, everything, mm -hmm. like punctuated equilibrium mm -hmm. in evolution. You have quantitative, you're a steady state, you're quantitative, and we've been here 2,000 years, mm -hmm. 200,000 years. We know that now right. from mitochondria and, lang and linguistic overlay. And now we get to the end of that. And one of the existential signals of that is did a program with um, Robert J. Lifton. We mm heard -hmm. just the other day, uh, back some time ago. But no question, he said that we finally got to the point with our cleverness of extending consciousness in technology and tools that the weapon systems that have always led the research for the geopolitical advantage of one tribe over another, they finally got to the point where if they were to be in the potentiality that exists, not an inflection point of a theory or something, mm -hmm. that if they were unleashed it would mean the end of our entire species. Mm -hmm. Now we couldn't do it in the Second World War, 
We were impotent in killing each other. Yeah. We were trying, you know? So we come to a point, and then there's got to be something on the living room side that's equally existentially significant, and we never hear anything about that. It's all the local politics about now it's the health care bill this week, yeah, as yeah. you and I talk. Is he going to get well, one or not? What I was going to say all is of that but one of the problems... The time of change is yeah. not just your normal time of change. Right. It's like... When you get to evolution, you get quantitative change, and then there's a quickening, and then there's what they call punctuated equilibrium, and right. the new appears, the right. way new species appear. Right, right. So we're at a time of qualitative, maybe coming to the end of the human experience, mm. coming to the end of our experience, or relating in a different way at another comprehensive level that encompasses everything, so it's a bit much to do. But when you can destroy the species, and we may have, as some people said, transcended material scarcity as an ontologic reality, hmm. which all our institutions were formulated in. So we don't hear this kind of thing. Fuller talked about it. Some mm -hmm. other. Anyway, I don't mean to no, no, you, make the point. You have an apocalyptic vision. The, it's it's not that. apocalyptic. It yeah. may be also a possibility for there to be ending the ancient scourges. James Joyce said, history is a nightmare from which I'm you, attempting you, to awaken. It's been always unjust. Yeah. It's always been a few people right, who ran right. everything. And, and we may be coming to a time of real, like, liberation. I don't want to say millennial, but coming to a time that has been in the future always in the human right. consciousness. I, I just read, and it might be now. I just read today that one of the founders of Facebook, uh, mm -hmm. this fellow Chris Hughes, uh, who then went to work for Obama and did this phenomenal you know, uh, online campaign. campaign yeah, fantastic. Is now starting something called Jumo. I don't What's know. That? Yeah. Well, it's it's a new form of social net networking that's okay. going to connect people around the world. Yeah. Uh, to to work on uh, specific issues that seem overwhelming and too big, mm -hmm. but trying to focus their efforts. Good. Send me a link. Oh yeah. If you it's, a it's just on the Huffington that's Post the, today. That's the kind of thing. That's the kind yeah. of thing. I mean, if you see something, yeah, yeah. put me on your list, will you? Okay. Of the of the tidbits that you come across okay. that help okay. inform the I human condition. I just think condition. that that was uh, understanding of the human yeah, condition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, but that's that's true. Another thing, I just did a program at aired last week. Do you are you aware of the uh, thing called the leadership directories? No. That's a very interesting mm -hmm. thing. It's a, a, a journal, thirteen volumes, like telephone book, right. and it's got in depth. The name, and it's it, keeping right up to date, like in the, ex it goes 11 echelons in the executive branch of the United mm -hmm. States, you know, the uh, director of per, uh, of, 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 per, of uh, purchase of, right, right. Uh, in Omaha, mm -hmm. and with phone numbers, emails, even idiosyncratic things, and they got a cross-referencing, so they can do cross-referencing and connection of the people on the boards and so forth. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting. They could be doing that in a lot of other fields. That's all technological stuff that's yeah, coming yeah. along. Yeah, we're... It's an exciting time. It's a very time. exciting time, it, it, definitely. You can imagine and being in a lot of states of mind, but being bored is something that's really hard. How can somebody be exactly, bored if exactly. they're intellectually exactly. uh, uh, I think, I think aware? Right. I think you're right. Are you optimistic, pessimistic for the human prospect? I, I, you know, I'll tell you something. Because we're, we're, there's so much pessimism about journalism today, but I'm oh, not. journalism. Okay. Well, but, I mean, this is a field I know. Okay, yeah. You know, right. and, okay. And, I, and I feel that there are more opportunities for journalism, and they'll figure out the pay structure. Right oh. now, it seems that everybody wants people to work for free, but I just think that there's, that there's enough smart young people who, uh, for whom uh, all this stuff that's dazzling us is like second nature to them. And, yeah, they can be really good with the technology. And a lot of it's technology. And, and, and a lot of it is, and I think that they're going to uh, find new ways of getting out uh, and, and and doing things. Okay, yeah. I mean, okay. I, so I, I, it's just a, a different uh, thing that we experience. I mean, okay. it'll, it, it's a sea change. Yeah. And I really, because, you know, this program that I've yeah. been trying to do, right. TV Lab, which is... Is this the one? Let me, yeah. I'm going to try and hold this up because it's okay. on a card and it's going to take them a while to come in. I'll just okay. hold it. You okay. talk to it. Right. Well, uh, and come in tight if you can with the robotic camera when you get it in focus. One yeah. of the other geniuses I met in my career was uh, Nam June Paik. Oh my gosh, and yeah. He was the pioneer of video art. Absolutely. And he, he asked about me, the second porta pack off the boat. For absolutely. Japan. I think so, yeah. Well, the first one apparently went to Lyndon Johnson. I think so. You know that story? <laughs> Do and, we have a year on that? Uh, in your, in I think that oh, I think it was 67, 68. Yeah, right. Okay. And Paik probably had the second one. Yeah. And. Um, but he, uh, 
Anyway, so he, he asked. Lab he, card oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. He asked me. This, this is. Uh, we designed this when I got into Independent Film Week, mm -hmm. selected for the Spotlight and Documentary Competition. Okay. And it's sort of reminiscent of his uh, inst uh, installations with a TV made out of TV sets. That, yeah, uh, right. That came up. Mm. But he asked me if I would make a film about the TV lab. Okay. Because I can take this down now. Right? That was from '72. Okay. A feature length document. Okay, good. This yeah. is in this is in the can or work. No, it's work in progress. Work in progress. Because okay, yeah. there were like two hundred artists that went. There. Uh huh. But what it was about mm -hmm. was about when television was the internet. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. It was like this period of innovation. Mm -hmm. And I was working down the hall. Mm -hmm. and I was working for Bill Moyers, Stud Sturkel, Robert McNeil, Stud Dick Cavett. And My he was God. doing these innovative, innovative programs. That's, uh, and I saw Murderer's most, Row, you just lined up. And like I the saw Yankees, most yeah. of these programs. Uh -huh. So he asked me to do it. Yeah. And it's a great thing. I mean, yeah. I was just talking to somebody this morning about multi channel TV things. Okay. The TV Lab did a two channel work uh -huh. Channel 13 and Channel 5 uh -huh. with Bob and Ray. You remember the radio? Bob and Ray were great. That was radio I associated but with But they, they were on TV. Radio. They went really good. I later worked with them okay. on a, f a show that I was senior producer of when called I, when Inside when Story with Hiding Carter. Okay, when I did the story, the thing with uh, Mr. Asimov, right? Yeah. I, I looked him up in the Who's Who or whatever, mm -hmm. and there, he had written about 700 books. Wow. He would write a book on every subject under the right. under the sun, like I would write a letter home to mother. Right. You know, right and right. he'd written it. So instead of when I started the thing, I said, instead of saying, "What have you written on?" Is there anything that you've not <laughs> been able to write on? Right. Yeah. And it was really funny yeah. because there was only one discipline that he did astrophysics, all mm. all physics, everything. And the only thing, uh, Shakespeare, he, the only thing he could not get his mind around or make any sense out of, can you guess what one no. econo uh, econo uh, academic discipline? Economics. Economic. He could <laughs> not fathom the baloney that goes in the name of economic right, right, theorizing, right, right, for right, rationalizing right. the, wow. and the economics is what informs right. the whole political process, right. which runs the world a lot. Yeah. Anyway, one of the things is you're too damned interesting, Howard. You've got to try and uh, tone down a little well, bit. Well, you, know you, know, you know what Dick Cavett would do? You know what Cavett would do? What would Cavett do? He'd say, well, you know, you've got to stay here because we're going to do another program. Mm -hmm. And then he'd sometimes say, well, okay, this, we, there's much more to cover, and we do a third program. And he would he would tape as many as three programs with a single guest. <laughs> well, that was that, well. Okay. So, we can't so do. We had another guest that. coming in at the end of this <laughs> hour. But anyway, the point being is yeah. we could talk for a million hours yeah. and everything. But the thing is, you've got some film footage you brought with it, yeah. right? Yeah. And maybe we could, as they say, set some of that up. Sure. And make to make sure we get it in before the end of the okay. hour in the eighties. Which one do you want to see? Well, you've got one on a, a piece of VHS footage or something. On Sit at ninety. Okay. Well, that was the one you, you know, set it up. What for. I was going to tell you was that when you work, as, mo as I did mostly, in a network or a PBS, mm -hmm. uh, y your job is to make a documentary, and you got to do it in eight weeks or yeah. two months mm -hmm. or whatever, or uh, three months or six months or whatever. And you got that deadline. You got the deadline, yeah. you got the budget, and mm -hmm. you make it. Mm -hmm. When you make something independently, yeah. It's not like that. Yeah. The whole it's it's can you raise the money? Yeah, right. Can uh, can you get all the resources, et cetera, mm. et cetera? Yeah. So there's nobody there to take care of the copyright issues. Mm. You have to do it. Mm. So, uh, but people say as for independent documentary filmmakers that subjects find you. Okay. And what happened in this case was, uh, I had just gotten a video camera. Uh huh. And. For yourself or for myself or, to yeah. actually work on the TV. What year project. are you talking? About? This is like. 90, 97, 98. Was it a beta cam SP? It or what no, was it? It, was, this was, uh, it was just when the DB came. came oh, oh, the when early the, digital. Okay, the yeah, early mini DB camera. Okay, okay. And yeah. the fact I yeah. knew at that time, Al Mazel's had the same camera. Yeah, <laughs> I right, did. Right. Now, of course, he's gone four yeah. generations beyond. I still got yeah. the same camera I've yeah. used for ten years. But I that camera was it was a TR a Sony TRV nine hundred. Okay, it was great. Yeah, all right. And and it was unobtrusive mm. and it was intimate and so you could have a good encounter yeah, with God the person. Sense. Yeah, right. Fabulous. Yeah. So my friends said to me, uh, two sisters, mm. one was a good friend, the other was uh, a neighbor, mm. and they said, you know, our dad is going to be 90 years old, uh -huh. and you've met him a, a few times, w would you uh, just interview him, a yeah, memoir yeah. for the family? Right, right, right. So I had these uh, student interns from Dartmouth, where mm. I went to college, where mm. I've taught, and uh, we're putting together the, the, the footage, and I said, see what you can make of this. Uh -huh. And I said, no, let's move it around. This, and then we do this, and I'm saying, you know what? 
This is far too interesting. Were you able to do this in digital editing in that? Yeah, yeah. We, we we used, a, uh, at that time, we used we Adobe would, Premiere. Adobe Premiere, yeah. And we were, ju PC, uh, yeah, we were just yeah. testing the, yeah. the system. Yeah. Well, and that's, um, that's the future you were working with, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to do, and so then I went back to the family and I said, wait a minute. You must have some home movies. Yeah. You must have some. Right. Uh, Go up to the attic. That's right. <laughs> yes, right. You must have some of his commercials. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can find the feature films he was in, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Right. And so uh, they said, yeah. So we put it together. And quite by accident, uh, I was in the park at a concert. Uh -huh. And I ran into a woman I knew from one of my other organizations, the New York Film and Video Council. Uh -huh. And they, she says to me, whatever happened to that film you were doing about the old Jewish comedian? Right, right. And I said, well. You know, it's almost finished. I'm still trying to raise some more money. She said, listen, show it to me. Uh -huh. So I showed it to her, and she said, Howard, if you can finish this in six weeks, uh, I will give it to our festival committee. Wow. And I did. I just bit the bullet, and it cost me $11,000 <laughs> out of pocket. Mm -hmm. I finished the damn thing. and Just under the wire? Just under the wire. Uh -huh. And it got into the 2003 New York Jewish Film Festival at Lincoln Center, uh -huh. and then played in about 20, 25 festivals Did they give it the any country. recognition at Oh, all? absolutely. It Did was, it get any prizes or anything? Well, it was uh, written up in the New York Daily News in a wonderful, wonderful. review. Good, 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 and good. And then when Sid died at the age of 98, mm, there was 98, a... 98, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. This was, you know, eight years after. He... Um, there was a um, an obit in the New York Times. Okay, yeah. But what's wonderful about Sid was, yeah, he said, I don't know if it's in this clip, but I I related to him because you whatever you do, you mm -hmm. have to find something that you relate to, you know. Right, right. And so what I thought about, well, not only do I like stand up comedy, but I yeah. like the fact that he was a freelancer. In yeah, effect. you like the you freelance. Know, was, yeah, yeah. He was wildcatter. He right? said, yeah. Doing the job wasn't hard. Uh -huh. Getting the job. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, so right. That, that really appealed to me. Did you so, like George Carlin? Oh, yeah. I love yeah, George yeah, Carlin. Yeah, and yeah. I, when Zero Mostel died, I wept. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's listen, take, so take it's a called look. Sit at 90, Sit right? at 90. And so I've got that set up, and let's see if they can get that rolling in the, uh, in the studio. Now, okay. we're talking again with Howard Steinberg. And Howard Weinberg. Howard, <laughs> Howard Weinberg. I'm sorry. <laughs> Run the tape, please. Run the tape. Okay. They haven't pumped the sound in here, but they will. I'm sorry, I got the rain okay. wrong. It won't be anything. Where are we in time? Uh, well, yeah, I'll show you, as a matter of fact. We well, got our everybody I was looking for 42. a job. Oh, and I so we got to get into the other one. Okay. There was an alley there with a bench with about six guys sitting on there. So I figured I was tired. I'd sit on a bench, too. So I said to the guy, move over. And I sat there, and one fella came out and said, and you fellas are the lucky ones who are now going to become ushers out of the 50 people we've looked at. And they gave me a dicky. You know what a dicky is? <laughs> Looks like a tuxedo. It's a thing with a, you have a bow tie and you cover it. And so you, it's cardboard, shiny cardboard, white. And every day they throw it away and give you another dicky. So I had a new dicky <laughs> every day. And I, I was an usher at the Rialto and, and at the Paramount. And I remember at that time there was a picture show called The Big Pond with Maurice Chevalier and with Claudette Colbert. And every time you would sing, if the nightingale could sing like you, you sing much better than they do, cause oh, who brought a new kind of love to you. And every time you'd sing that, I would walk down the aisle like I was counting the empty seats to watch Chevalier and see what it's doing. Because when I was younger, I put Chevalier into my act with the straw hat. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Fine, okay. <laughs> and the nightingale could sing like you. So I quit the job. I became an actor. And I do my act by telling a few jokes first. One of the jokes, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Shapiro were on their way to Miami. The car broke down in front of a farmhouse. And while Shapiro was fixing the car, the farmer called uh, Mrs. Shapiro aside and said, Mrs. Shapiro, I want to show you the fine features of our farm. He says, you see that bull over there? Would you believe it that that bull has made it 365 days out of the year? She says, is that so? She says, look, do me a favor. Would you see my husband? Tell him that. 
says, why not? He says, Shapiro says, Shapiro, I want to show you the fine features of our farm. And there's one thing in particular. Your wife wants me to call to your attention, that bull over there. Would you believe it? That that bull has made it 365 days out of a year? Shapiro says to the same cow? He says, oh, no. He says, tell that to my wife when you see her. <laughs> See, and then while I got them laughing, and I say, here are a few guest stars that I brought with me, and the first person I want you to meet is Bert Law. And I did, hiya boy, hiya, and I would do that, uh, uh, you know, Bert Law. I was social director in the mountains at a hotel called The Majestic in Hurleyville. But then I met Dorothy. She came up to see someone else, and I wound up yeah. as her husband. I get up to see one of the musicians. He played the piano, so he couldn't dance with me. So he was a social director, and I danced with him. Oh, I sent him a telegram. That's right. I said, uh, I'm going to send you $100. Join me in Seattle. She says, make it 100 and a quarter, you got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no dope. So that's really what happened. We were married, and we had the first seat in the bus. Yes. And we played one-nighters. Four you shows a day. On? My name is Raymond Silverstein. And uh, then I did a professional job as, in a show called The World's Fair Follies. My name was Ray Silvers. And when I went on with Major Bose, they couldn't use a professional name. And they said, we got to change your name. Raymond is good. How about a first name? I said, I don't know. He says, Sid. Hey, Sid isn't bad. I said, okay, Sid Raymond. My name was Sid Raymond. So after that, I, I went on the Major Bow Show with Sid Raymond. And I did my impressions, came out first, joined the unit, and then I got a call. They're running out of talent. They want to put me on again, but they can't use Sid Raymond. What name are you going to use? I had a friend of mine by the name of Milton and another friend by the name of Harry. So I went on with the name of Milton Harris. Thanks to me, we won the war. Uh, uh, I thought it was Bob Hope. Now, well, you see, Bob Hope played to the rest areas. We played up in the front. Ours was called a foxhole unit. Five people, no girls, only men. I was the MC. And invariably, because of my experience with Major Bowes, where we played almost every little theater from coast to coast, I would say to the audience, all to these soldiers, tell me where you're from, and I'll tell you the hotel I stayed at, the theater I played, and the restaurant I ate in. And whenever I was stuck, and I would say, anybody here from Tennessee? The guy says, yes, I am. I said, how does it feel wearing shoes? You know, all these things. And then I said, any songs at all, he'll play it for you. The guy says, I walk along. I said, what do you got, B.O.? I was working in a town called, uh, oh, Valdosta, Valdosta, Georgia. And uh, Major Bowles sent a telegram knowing that President Roosevelt was in Warm Springs, Georgia, and said, Mr. President, how would you like to be entertained by one of our units that's very close to you? He said, yes. So we came down there. He was sitting there in a wheelchair. I was the MC, introduced all the acts. And Wait. It's okay. Okay. okay <laughs> that's so funny. That's great. And that was he. He was just being himself, wasn't he? Well, but he I was, mean, he was, he was a consummate professional. Yeah. And because when you play the one night, funny. Is, oh, he's in, funny. Yeah. But but the way he would tell a story, yeah, you could yeah. see it was polished. Right. And, and I was awed. Oh, by that. right. Just, yeah, it's it's, it's too bad you couldn't understand. He was from New York. <laughs> I mean, he was so quintessential New York. It's really great. New York's yeah. a great town. He was. He, he Sid was really one of a kind. He was really wonderful. Uh huh. It was and great. You know, you could put that together, and you got a lot of attention with that. Film. We did, we yeah, did, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, one of my favorite stories is it played in the Jewish Film Festival in Contra Costa, California. Yes. A year later, it played in the regular festival in Contra Costa, <laughs> California. So I said, "This is great," you know, because I wanted him to be universal. Avatar, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it was it was great. And yeah, okay. There's so much we could do. And listen, let's try. We got another film. We got about yeah. ten minutes left, right? Well, I want to we show you the, the TV Lab see, documentary. See, see, okay, what yeah. do you, set it up quick. Though. Okay. 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 Well, this this is a the, uh, the beginning of a tease that gives you the flavor. Mm -hmm. You'll first see a picture of Charlotte Moorman, mm -hmm. who, yeah, who okay. I did a separate the, film on, yeah. Uh, yeah, who was be, called yeah. the Topless Cellist. Right, right. And she was Nam June Paik's muse. Uh huh. But this extraordinary 
time of innovation in mm -hmm. public television mm -hmm. was you you were part of it the the, mm. the porta pack was invented uh, the documentary suddenly became intimate behind the yeah, scenes right. video art was invented uh, it became a worldwide a uh, yeah, worldwide phenomenon and the yeah, yeah exactly yeah 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 yeah, yeah, it, yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. and and a large part of, i want this to be an educational documentary mm. that goes out to students who now have you know, wondrous technology right. to see what the people who had this imagination to and, and didn't have that extraordinary good. technology, but just did wonderful things. Good for you. That's really good. It's a so good here's lesson a sample to go it. like that. And let's see if we can't set that up. This is going to be running off a DVD. And if you could run that now, if you got that queued up, again, uh, we're we're talking to um, Howard Weisberg and <laughs> run the thing. I'm <laughs> In this world of ordinary people, extraordinary people, I'm glad there is you. It was not just a flash in the pan. We were talking about a genuine phenomenon, and uh, it has broadened everyone's vision. Artists already do something which mainline culture don't do. And since Hollywood and then NET is making so many interesting shows, artists has to make boring shows. And suddenly, if Hollywood and NET start making very boring shows, we will make exciting shows. Uh. The whole idea about the, the TV lab was an environment conducive to creativity. L literally good. one where an artist could put their hands on the camera, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, without the union saying, you're not yeah, qualified. Yeah. David Loxton actually made video art accessible to the public. It would be comparable to putting uh, the paintings in the Guggenheim on subway walls. Because whatever Jesus taught to his disciples has not disappeared. It's still there. The idea that uh, you could take this equipment and apply it to journalism and therefore kind of you know, do your own t mainstream television, that was the radical idea. I'm a real stomp down Republican, love the Republican, don't see anything else but Republicanism. I like Nixon and I like Ford. <laughs> We wanted to kind of upset the aesthetic apple cart of then broadcast television. When it came to beach, you spelt it B-E-E-C-H, which is like the, uh, well, there's a gum called beach nut gum. But the correct spelling is we meant beach like the sand. So it's, it should have been like the ocean. B B-A-C-H. See, that's the difference. Well, okay, I forgive you. 
the idea that there might be something else, that public television might offer something else, and then, right, all right. then maybe all cable right. television might good. offer right. something else. Cut the else. audio. This cut was, the audio. We'll talk well, about there, there, all there that. are a couple Funny. hours of material. I love <laughs> that. That was so great. M. Schweiler and M Michael Schamberg went on to make movies in a big time. He just way. made this new movie, Extraordinary Measures. Okay, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's a big-time filmmaker. No, he's all, all, continuing. Yeah. And uh, Paul Ryan was that part yeah. of the Barrel yeah. Co-op and yeah, the yeah. Rain Dance and the, they're, they're, the Radical Song. There are more people than you can put into this yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. it's, I, I probably have interviewed 60 people Good for this. For you. I Good still have an you. interview with Bill Wegman. I haven't been able to edit it yet. Got, you still got it in tape. You got it uh, You got it. Mini DV right? tape. You got, got it ready to edit, right? Yeah. So you could do another thing. Yeah. Now, what's happened? This is to show TV. This was this was when we got into Independent Film Week. Right. And then it's. I also put a shorter version uh, online for grant makers for film and electronic media. Good for you, yeah. So, you know. And I know you've been in touch with some of the people in public access. Oh, you sure. Know you know yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. George, you know George Stoney. George yeah. Stoney is a, is a, yeah. is a living... Well, that's guy. through the New York Film Video Council. Okay. And that You're kind involved of in that, yeah. I'm the longest serving president. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Congratulations. Uh, this 64-year-old organization. Really? I, yeah. Okay, i got to get yeah. more aware of that. And, and I'll tell you what, this is yeah. an interesting story about yeah. how I happened to join it. Uh, mm -hmm. Willard Van Dyke, who is... Set it up a little bit. What is it? What is the it? The New York Film and Video Council yeah, yeah. is a volunteer organization that does monthly programs, a uh, wide variety of things on inter international issues or films that you wouldn't see otherwise, on ma honoring masters of the craft, uh -huh. like Al Maisel's yeah, and right. Bill Sloan and Bill Grease. Yeah, uh -huh. um, Cutting edge issues like HD TV, okay. uh, internet TV, great, and and other things, and, and issues like fair use, okay, yeah. or trends like animation and documentary. And stuff? We we have regular. Are they all New York, or are they all over the country? We're, well, originally it was. It was part of the whole. Uh, uh, educational Film Library movement. Yeah, it okay. was about a disseminating independent right, media. Right. And n I think there's, uh, a, there no, there's no connections, but the one in New York was the first and it still survives. Yeah, right, New York's the place. And yeah. um, so, as so I say, I, Willard Van Dyke, who we was there. a couple minutes. I'll so take it. Sound bite, sound bite, sound bite. Hurry it up. So, hurry basically, up what, what it was, is he said, well, you're going to go into television, yeah, right, right. but keep one hand in the independent okay, film world. Yeah, right. And that right. was great advice. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, I joined the New York Film Video Council. I'd go to a couple of programs a year. Yeah. Uh -huh. And long in the 90s, they discovered me, said, uh -huh. you be on the board. Okay. I said, okay, then uh -huh. be president. Uh -huh. So, I was. And then a couple other people served. They said, come back and be president. Uh -huh. So, now. So, they there you are. Six, there you yeah, are. Six president. Years yeah, well and, deserved, and, yeah. and it's a wonderful opportunity yeah. because. Uh, it, you have a wide outreach to the people that are yeah. involved, including a lot of the people in things like public access, Absolutely. which is very democratically spread We've out. We've done programs here. And that's here. one of the hallmarks of what the technology is making available. It's not all a Bolex you have to have and all that. Right. You know, it's a it's everybody. And now the film, I mean, we're moving very quickly. You knew, you knew um, uh, uh, C.T. Louie? Sure. Yeah, C.T. Louie's a great guy. Yeah, that's where Pate got his portrait. They've got they've got all of the equipment going, all the iterations of the equipment of this multimedia shift that began about 1967 with the Porta Pack. Now you got a cell phone that sits in your hand. You can make a television program. Absolutely. And the program and distributions, but we're, so we're becoming multimedia. Right. What have here. you got? Are you going to do it? You're going to demonstrate it already? No, I, I, I'm just thinking that uh, a friend of mine, when, when the um, when oh, you're going to take a picture. Well, uh, yeah. Why not? I, you know. Okay. Well, so, take, so go I, ahead. I'm ready for my close-up, <laughs> Mr. Demille. <laughs> so I mean, basically, you can just do this, and then if I oh, knew you're how taping. To, you're yeah. taping. Oh, you're taping. Oh, of I course. was ready. I was making a still. No, no, like, no. I mean, and, and so when when the flip video camera came out, we better out, run the graphics, gang. When a yeah. flip video camera came out, mm -hmm. a friend of mine on the subway mm -hmm. took a picture of me like this, uh -huh. and he posted it on YouTube. Yeah, right. And they, there it was. They watched it in Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah, yeah. That's what happened. These programs are being streamed from MNN now to the internet Ooh, and they're there. being done in flashes damn near television and they can be seen on cell phones in anywhere in the world there's a rumor that the penguins in Antarctica are watching the programs well, it's I hope big, they are. Yeah. I hope they are. We finally got the tuxedo set. You huh? saw Werner Herzog's film? No, I haven't. No, where he no, uh, no. uh, encounters at the end of the world? No. He said, first of all, this is not about penguins. I'm not interested <laughs> in penguins. I didn't see that. Because it, that was, it was right after uh, you know, the penguin film. Oh, okay. Oh, the pe Happy Feet. No. Oh. The, you know. Oh. 
the the French one where they oh, went. Okay. Uh, well, oh, the March of the Penguins. Where, oh, oh, okay, yeah, right. Well, that what that Happy Feet followed on. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Isn't that something the way they do that? Absolutely. How the hell can they live well, in such weather? I don't know why would they. Don't I don't know, but the, south. the first time they showed that to people, the French said too many penguins died, so they said we can't have that. We've got to, <laughs> got to alter reality a little bit. Well, a great thing, and it looks like we've gone. To